and you're seeing people progressing in dementia. And what we also saw was that it didn't appear like anybody ever walked down the hall to the behavioral medicine department and said, hey, can you guys do anything about this? So we started a, a study to actually train people both in the clinic and also at home by training their caregivers to do neurofeedback, QEG driven, to show whether neuropsychological functioning and testing would change as well as QEG would change if all we did was train people to decrease slow wave activity and increase fast wave activity. Well, we presented that at the um, Alzheimer's Association International meeting in Vienna back in 2009. And um, well, as you can imagine, there were about 1,500 presentations and there were two that weren't about drugs. And we were one of the two and the other one was a QEG study from Romania. Um, go figure. But it was in the middle of that study that we discovered that um, there was another technology that we were completely unaware of and it was one of the founders, one of the sponsors of the study, his, the husband, sent me an email that said, what the hell is this? And it was a link to a Daily Mail article in the, uh, in the UK and the headline was UK researchers reverse dementia with infrared light. And I was like, well, the guy's desperate, but, and so I took a look at it and found that it was really a paper published in the British Journal of Neuroscience and that the university at Durham, along with Dr. Gordon Dougal, had actually been studying the effects of near-infrared light on cognitive functioning and brain physiology and showing that there were significant changes. So what I want to do is uh, take you through kind of the results of us having discovered that fact and then started to work with applying near-infrared using the 1068, it's 1068 nanometers, which is really about 1065 to 1080 um, in terms of the, the frequency range in the, in the electromagnetic spectrum. But there are other frequencies that have been used and with very good results, specifically 810 nanometer. So what I'm going to talk about here is going to be a little bit of both. And um, so let's get started. Um, I'm not sure how we can deal with questions. I think what probably should happen is save the questions unless there's something unclear and then uh, just chime in and I'll, I'll try to answer as quickly as possible. So. Um, this is basically what we're going to cover, the photobiomodulation, the background science around neurofeedback, the current research around photobiomodulation and neuro neurofeedback, and then where we are in terms of our research and development path for integrating all of the above. Um, the essential method that we're looking at is to take the cue and make a protocol, a training protocol, that would be basically a Loretta training protocol and then use, ultimately use, real-time QEEG to drive the near-infrared or other kinds of stimulation and to then drive the z-scores towards zero. So we're essentially trying to combine the, the intervention that's going to affect the tissue level pathology directly which is the infrared and the photo my, by photobiomodulation. We also want to then renormalize the EEG connectivity and the overarching goal is to essentially optimize what we, what we call somebody's adaptive response capacity. So if this is going to be effective as an intervention, it's going to need to do these four things. It's going to need to promote neuroprotection and foster neuroregeneration. We're going to need to see toxic protein accumulation being declining and, and prevented. And we're also going to want to see a, an appropriate regulation of neurotransmitters. So the spectrum that we're working in is from, it's the A level of near infrared, which is around 760 to 1400 nanometers. Now, when you look at the 
transmission of infrared light through the pure water molecule, you can see um, that there's a significant level of transmission in the 800 range and then it drops off rather significantly around 1,000 and then it comes back up around 1072. We're thinking at this point that there's some kind of difference between the 810 and the 1070 that is significant in some bioactive way. Some biological uh, influence is happening at that bump that is not necessarily happening at the 810. And the work we're doing now is going to be on comparing outcomes between the two frequencies. And at this point, the, those studies are in the formative stages. But what we can see is that we're getting very good penetration and also bioactivity in that range between around 800 to about uh, 1100 nanometers. When, um, when they, this is the background basic science and uh, it, it's worth noting because it, it does offer a fairly good basis for why we find this to be efficacious at this point. So what they started with was white blood cells and pre-treated them with the infrared, the 1070, and then they had a, um, an exposure to ultraviolet A radiation. And you can see that the viability, the percentage of viability, was twice in the treated group, the pre-treated group, than in the untreated group. They did the same sort of protocol with neurons that had been kept alive in culture and then exposed to different concentrations of uh, nitric oxide. And so you can see that with a mild attack, if you will, of nitric oxide, there was a neuroprotection amongst the group that had been pretreated of over 90%. When it was moderate concentration, you got about 28% survival. And like I've said, if you hit them with a sledgehammer, then they don't make it. But when they looked at five-day survivability with those same lymphocytes, they showed that the 1072 treated group had a much higher viability rate. They then tested a number of different frequencies, and you can see that the 1072, which again is, is a range between, say, 1065 and 1080. Um, there's no real there's no there's no real such thing as being able to focus LED light to one specific frequency continuously. Um, so it's always in a range. But you can see that some frequencies did have an effect and positive to some degree, but the 1072 alone was more efficacious than any of the others. And it didn't matter whether it was for one microsecond exposure or seven microseconds in terms of the um, pulse width, the delay between pulses. This was the really interesting study. I would have given anything to be in the uh, IRB room at the University of Bristol when these people came in and said, well, what we want to do is while people are undergoing uh, craniotomy-based uh, neurosurgery, we want them to agree to let us do a little experiment on their brain with near-infrared light. Somehow they got approval and what they were able to do was put a emitter on the scalp surface and a detector on the actual cortex surface and measure the amount of energy, light energy, getting through each layer from the scalp down to the cortex and then measuring the penetration. So what we, they found was that there was about 6 to 10 percent of the projected light getting through to about 3 to 5 centimeters in the cortex. That's rather significant because that would mean that we're getting stimulation to about 80 percent of the pyramidal neurons in the cortex. And interestingly enough, as you can see, the loss from bone was next to nothing. It was almost the same as from Dura and CSF. Is there a question there? Okay. Um, so, 
they took the mice that they had been treating, and uh, these are this certain kind of mouse that quickly develops the beta amyloid. And um, I'm hearing noise in the background. Is that me? Uh, well, if you hear it, go ahead and just be silent, and Richard will try to figure out. He can see who's making it, and we'll just mute them. Mute them. What a thing to say. Well, um, that's when people aren't being good. <laughs> when, when you're presenting, that's, we, we mute them. I know it sounds horrible, but it's, it it's does, unfair. It <laughs> that's right. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Mark. Here Folks, we go. Mute yourselves if you're not talking, please. Mute yourselves if you're not talking. Thank you. So, you can see the progression of the <laughs> small plaque development in over the course of a year. And now, what you can see is the difference between the sham on the left and the treated infrared treated brain tissue in the four main areas of the brain that are associated with the onset and progression of dementia. So this is kind of the smoking gun slide that shows that we're actually, at, you know, with just shining a uh, about 600 milliwatts of near infrared light at 10 65 to 1080 nanometers, you're actually getting a reduction in small plaque in the brain. Um, you can see that in this slide, there is also a noticeable reduction of about 40% in what's called a precursor protein or A beta 42, which is um, in and of itself a neurotoxin. And by reducing the presence of A beta 42, you're actually blocking the ability of the body to produce uh, amyloid plaque. So, when we're thinking about the overall impact of transcranial and laser or NIR, but at this point we're talking about laser therapy, but it's pretty much the same with near infrared and in some cases even better. You're seeing significantly reduced total A beta plaques and that's at 810 and 1072. Um, there was also a mitigation of amyloid deposition and the behavioral effects that came from that were also reduced. There was significant reduction in the inflammatory cytokine markers in transgenic mice and so Increased ATP, increased mitochondrial function, and CFOS expression, we're talking about an overall improvement in neurological function just from this alone. This is a list of published data about the different mechanisms of action that have to do with the influence of ATP on a beta production. I'm not going to go into that now because we're not biochemists, uh, but it's here if you want it, and I can get you the citations. Um, this is also important in terms of when the cells are under attack and in danger of dying, one of the things that gets released are called heat shock proteins. And what they found in the, in the study was that the relevant heat shock proteins that mitigate against uh, cell death were significantly increased and um, that certainly made a big difference in the production of specific kinds of regulatory proteins in the Krebs cycle and something called BDNF and that really bears on the ability of the neurons to repair and regenerate. Um, this is another one of those slides that if you, you know, if you do a presentation in front of people who are biochemistry types, you have to have one of these slides where they think you don't know what you're talking about. But essentially, this is the mitochondria, and here are the heat shock proteins that are mitigating against the apoptosis process or cell death. So um, this is more my area where they took the mice and ran them through a radial arm maze. So they put the food around at the end of all the arms that are at different heights inside of a large box. Then they put the mouse inside and they videotape how long it takes for the mouse to get all the food and how many perseverations and times that it stops and looks around. And that's how they measure memory function. 
And so you can see that with the treated mice, the, um, the number of errors was significantly better, less, than with the uh, control mice. And the dotted, the little dotted line was kind of a cute thing that they did. They took a run, they, they had a run of normal adolescent mice through the maze, untreated, but just normal adolescent mice. And the middle-aged mice that got treated did better than them. So there's hope for those of us over 40. Um, this is pretty much the wow slide as far as I'm concerned. And this is one of Dr. Dougal's patients, though I have I have pictures like this as well from people who have different kinds of dementia, but the woman came in on day one and was asked to draw a clock at 10 minutes with a hand's time at 10 after 11, and um, she drew what's in the upper middle, and then six weeks late, five weeks later, uh, having done six minutes of treatment every day, seven days a week, she drew the other picture. This is an early a pretty recent version, though not the not the ultimate version of the device that we're using now. Um, and as you can see, it's uh, entirely 3D printed. Uh, not the PCBs, but the the housing and everything else is all 3D printed from a desktop 3D printer. It's pretty amazing. Um, this is the poster that we put up in um, 2009, showing that the people. Um, I don't actually have a pointer, do I, Richard? We see your mouse. This is Martin. Oh, you do. We okay. can see it. If you, if you, you move it slowly. We can see it. Okay, let me put this away. So um, this, this reading here is the aggregate of the subjects in the trial who significantly improved in terms of slow wave activity. You can see that the slow wave activity significantly diminished between uh, control and the people who improved and those who didn't. And also you can see that there were significant improvements and increases in fast wave activity where we would like to see it happening for those people. And then there were sig significant improvements in a number of different memory measures that we used in the study. Um, I'll be happy. Anybody can just email me and I'll send them the slide deck so you can blow this up and, and get a better look at everything. Um, now this is a study that was done using the V-Lite um, and it was presented at the Alzheimer's meeting in 2014 and they used an 810 nanometer device and they got this guy Rudy to do a trial and he did pretty well on a number of different measures uh, using the transcranial and the intranasal device. So they're going after increasing stimulation to the, to the brain directly through the nasal cavity as well as using very powerful uh, diodes that are positioned at the default mode network. So FZ, P3, PZ, and P4. And they got, you know, decent improvements. There's another study that's not in this slide deck um, that I would like that I'll send out that shows even better improvement in a group of people who were treated, and that's that study's in press now. Uh, should be coming out hopefully in the next couple of months, and they showed that twice a week with the transcranial and intranasal stimulation, and then five times a week with just the intranasal, was able to produce significant improvements in mini mental status uh, scores for people who had moderately severe levels of dementia. Um, I don't know how many people have seen what has been happening at um, the peak hour lab, about 40 hertz stimulation. Um, I think I should be able to get this to play. This is a really important piece of work that happened at uh, Dr. Sai's lab.
if there's an audio to this, Marvin, I don't think we're picking it up. Oh, you're not picking it up. Oh, that's too bad. Uh, what would what would it take to do that? Uh, I don't know if we can. This it's uh, go to meetings oh. kind of quirky about that. Oh, technology glitch. Okay, then let's let's skip this. Um, if you are mm-hmm. able to send out uh, the audio separately, we can send it out to people. Uh, basically, the link is right in the deck, so people can right. just load. Right. You'll, they'll load it and, and see it when they when they get to that part of the stu- the, the show. It's okay. fine. So, <clears throat> here, yeah, that's great. So um, this is the dementia pilot study that I was just talking about, and they took 19 patients that were randomized two to one active treatment to sham, and they showed that there was a, a fairly uh, significant range of deficits in memory, cognition, and functioning. And what they did was mini, men- mini mental status and ADAS cog assessments, and they tested them at baseline at six weeks, 12 weeks, and then after four, after four weeks of no treatment. And there was a, a daily home journal. And you can see that with the people who had really significant problems in, in functioning that their ADAS scores, their ADAS and mini mental scores were significantly improved. And with ADAS you want a lower score with that, whereas mini mental you want a higher score. So you all know what this is. Um, oh, I like that noise. Um, So, this is just something to let people know that there has been research showing that there's very good predictive accuracy using the cue to discriminate between people with Alzheimer's and age-related controls. Uh, The study that we did, which is really just a a pilot, a nine-subject study that we did using just the helmet, and uh, this is now in press in, I think, a jur- the journal is called uh, Neuroplasticity. But what we were showing is that the people who were getting the active 1060 to 1080 stimulation were doing better on mini mental status as well uh, as digit span forward and aggregate length post testing. So it's it's, it's, a, it's an indication that we're headed in the right direction. There's a trial now ongoing at um, Baylor Scott and White in Temple, Texas that is going to have 12 subjects in a randomized double-blind placebo trial that's being run through the Department of Neurosurgery at uh, Baylor Scott and White. And we're expecting to see results out of that by sometime in late June, early July. Um, this is just a recent person that we took into the clinical trial. Uh, it's a longer-term clinical trial because we had to set up a long-term clinical trial because people who were doing the treatment in the short-term trials, when it came time to say, okay, thank you very much, can we have the helmet back, they kind of looked at us like, are you kidding me? And we said, no, we really have to you know, take it back. And you know, after hearing how this was just not an acceptable solution, we then went to our lawyers and found out how we can extend the treatment using the larger 1072 technology um, as, as an extended clinical trial because it's not a product that we can sell to anybody. That was part of the motivation for finding the V-Light because we needed something that was commercially available that had been FDA cleared uh, as a non-significant risk device, which the V-Lite has been, that we could then offer to people and say, here, this isn't exactly what you were using, but it's legal and it's not expensive in the grand scheme of things, and it really does help. So here's a cue of a woman who was admitted into an assisted living facility voluntarily by herself and her daughter, and she was in the dementia unit uh, for about a week when uh, then the daughter found out about what we were doing and said, could you please put, you put my mom in the trial? So we went over there and started her on the trial on October 8th 
last year, and on January 18th, she uh, she did a QEEG and has since been uh, discharged from the dementia unit uh, and is now having conversations with her daughter about whether she needs to be in assisted living at all, which is kind of exciting. Um, I'm not so sure how the people at the assisted living facility feel about it, but that's a different story. Um, so these are some cues pre and post of people who've used the intranasal device. Um, so I thought I would just present that. Um, this is the v 810 intranasal, and you can see uh, what happened. They used the device in their right nostril, and you can see what happened to the delta and theta. And certainly uh, the frontal coherence had uh, a very desirable improvement, and this is a 25-minute treatment. Uh, here's a transcranial and intranasal. This is the neuro, and this is a guy who's had a lot of... Um, social anxiety and other kinds of issues and um, he significantly improved in terms of his mood score. He certainly felt a lot better after the 20 minutes of using the neuro. And you can see the changes were pretty marked in terms of slow wave hypocoherence and also increased, uh, decreased amplitude in the slow, se slow section. Um, this, is a, this is a little link to uh, Bob Thatcher talking about what, what Z-score Loretta training is. I don't need to go over that with you guys. This is a picture from, I think, Rob Coben um, about pre-post neurofeedback changes in infrared in terms of blood flow. And we're going to be using um, infrared cameras that can be attached to the iPhone or Android phone so we can take pre and post pictures of people uh, when they're doing the treatment now in the clinical trials. This is really what this is all about. And this is our uh, longest treating client. Uh, her name's Joan. And in 2012, she was pretty much non-communicative, uh, irritable, sometimes rather aggressive and basically withdrawn uh, nonverbal or basically talking word salad. Uh, we started her on the uh, infrared helmet in 2014 and we saw some marked improvement from that and then I got her husband to agree to start doing uh, Loretta Z-score training in uh, later 2000. 14 and 15, and here's a picture of Joan after having completed <laughs> a four-day, 800-mile motorcycle trip that she and her husband loved to do, but couldn't do for the last two years for a number of reasons, and here she is having had a really good time. Um, in terms of what we're looking at as far as the future goes, what we want to do is work uh, with some biomedical engineering folks at Drexel and other biomedical engineering labs to construct a dry electrode near infrared photobiomodulation device that's going to be low cost and easy to deploy. We want to also then integrate near infrared with pulsed electromagnetic frequencies with transcranial direct and alternating and variable stimulation as well as targeted ultrasound. And we're working on software algorithms that can be used to both identify uh, where the stimulation would be most effective at what frequency or at what intensity and which type of stimulation would be most effective. And that's where we're going to end up uh, being able to deliver this in some kind of remote control uh, home treatment type model. And obviously, you know, somewhere down the road we want to get FDA to cover this uh, as being an appropriate treatment for Alzheimer's and frontotemporal dementia, Parkinson's, dry macular degeneration, and TBI. Um, 
these are the current clinical trials that are ongoing at the moment. Um, so there's an early to mid-stage dementia trial that's down at Temple, Texas at Baylor, Scott & White, and they're connected with Texas A&M University uh, in the Department of Neurosurgery. We're doing an age-related memory impairment study uh, at the clinic uh, in Elkins Park where we're moving this weekend. Um, anybody want to come over and move boxes, you're more than welcome. Um, we're going to do a Parkinson's, we're starting a Parkinson's trial in the villages in Florida in the next couple of weeks and we'll be using the helmet and measuring change in forearm bradykinesia and gait stability. Uh, this will be a home-based treatment just like with the age-related memory impairment. People are going to take the units home and they're going to use them for five minutes twice a day every day for 60 days and they're going to take a selfie while, while the unit's running and they're going to email me or text me the selfie so that we can maintain compliance with the protocol. Um, and then the V-Lite Neuro is going to be a similar active treatment protocol for uh, people who have any number of different conditions and what we're trying to do is get clinicians throughout the neurofeedback community to encourage patients to get one of these devices at a significant discount and then agree to have a queue done before they start using it and about two months later and we want to then be able to show the changes in cue response and treatment response uh, from the neuro treatment. Um, and that, my friends, is all she wrote. So I can take questions for 15 minutes. Dr. Bremond, this is Martin Gremlich. Fascinating. I'm, I'm absolutely happy. Thank you very much indeed. Question. More. More. Go ahead. Uh, why are you using pulsed frequencies as opposed to um, sinus frequencies? Is that technical? LED? It, it's it's technical. It's technical in the sense that we are we're in the middle of a debate about continuous versus pulsed. The yeah, here is here is the argument. Um, um, the frequency range you're talking about, 1072 is one of the so-called holes of a natural tropical atmosphere where there is a, a, a big amount of frequency in this range yeah. traveling through the atmosphere and actually uh, powering up live objects or live organisms on the surface. And um, it indicates what you're saying here that the study indicates that uh, we see in Alzheimer or a component of Alzheimer could be electromagnetic pollution light. I, I certainly think that what we're what we're dealing with here is uh, Martin, I, 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 that's a point well taken. Pollution both in terms of neuroinflammatory processes due to infectious problems that yes. people are experiencing has to be taken seriously, has to be taken into consideration in doing a comprehensive assessment for treatment. I couldn't agree more. Um, so, so you're in a very good track here. I'm, I'm fascinated, absolutely. I've never well, heard of this technology before. What I'm, what I'm here, the, the, the play, the, actually the building where I'm doing the presentation from is called Montgomery Integrative Health Group. And 20 feet away from me is an entire functional medicine clinical biomedical group that can do all of the functional medicine assessments for making sure that people are dealing with the underlying uh, cell membrane and allergy and uh, bacterial and other kinds of infectious processes and then for those people who have traumatic injuries we can then use the neurofeedback as a way to address the connectivity problems that aren't really going to be addressed so well by the lipid and the uh, you know the other kinds of interventions that are more biomedical. So what we've got here is a way to address both the tissue level pathology and the connectivity problems that prevent 
a more robust kind of recovery process from taking place as well as stabilizing people over the long term. This is fantastic. Just a short question, I don't want to block the webinar here. Um, would you be open for a uh, phone exchange? Certainly. I was, I, you, and I, you, and I had email, you and I had an email exchange. Okay, I, good. I read all your, I watched all your videos. <laughs> is that so? <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. Like, oh, oh, yes we did, yes. <laughs> okay, let's pick that up again, please. Certainly, Martin. Take care. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Hey, Marvin. Jeff Reich. How are you? Hey, Jeff. Good. Uh, as hey, you know, Mark. we bought two units at ISNR. We, we've been using them religiously since we've You know this isn't a religious webinar, right? <laughs> but we've been using them religiously, meaning that we don't have a client that goes without its use. Oh, that's great. And, um, we, we, we actually do some PEMF before uh, neurofeedback, we put the cap on and actually put the V-light over the cap. Yes, very, that's doing great. Loretta training. That's yeah, great. and we did this based on what we saw at ISNR with what you did with Tom and uh, Dr. Thatcher. Right. No, it's, it's uh, yeah, a lot of people, a lot of people have been in touch lately and wanting to set up their practice to, to combine these approaches. And one of the things, just uh, to fill you in, um, did I tell you to reverse the array for Parkinson's and dementia? No, no. We still put this, the single oh. unit up front and the multiple unit in the back. Okay. So, so what you could try is switching off every day and reversing the array so the three arrays are over the motor strip and the other single array is at OZ. Okay. And with Parkinson's, what we're doing is getting the stimulation into the substantia nigra so that we can then stimulate and protect, hopefully, the dopamine-producing neurons that are primarily generated out of the substantia nigra. Makes a lot of sense. And anyway, what we're seeing is, you know, since the beginning, that we get drastic reductions in high beta right off the bat. It's awesome. like we've had people with 30, 40, 50 sessions where high beta hasn't moved, and then all of a sudden, bang, their high beta is gone. And okay. a lot of change in coherence, both hyper and hypo. But the most amazing thing is, you know, I'm working in a functional medicine office where oh, they're, great. Taking That's right. lots, That's right. they're taking lots of supplements and, and and it's so important that they get the metabolic uh, backing, and then the and then everything seems to hold. <laughs> yeah, N neurofeedback is not going to significantly improve cell membrane uh, stability. Right, right. So the metabolic backing is really, really yeah, a key. But, yeah. And we've yeah. gotten unbelievable results. It's well, been it's uh, that's great. Listen, I'll send you a check later. No, no, not at all. <laughs> it's it's um, been well worth uh, the price of admission. <laughs> Thanks, Marvin, Mark. I'm going to pick up on Jeff's question and and uh, and go uh, in a slightly different direction. Right. A lot of people here aren't using systems that would involve full cap training. They're not using Loretta. They're oftentimes using systems that allow for only one, two, or four channel trainings. So my question to you is, one, if they started with just like the nasal V-Light, how beneficial would that be in addressing some of the issues? And if they were to go and get the full cap um, V-Light, but not put it on top of a cap when they're doing training, but you use it separately. Yeah. How beneficial would they? How much benefit would they get from using just the V light and this this uh, okay. technology in and of itself? Um, well, like my like my physics professor used to say, um, that's a rather testable hypothesis. Um, but I don't know because I don't believe that the photons coming from the intranasal device actually make it to the brain. I think what they're doing is stimulating through the mucosal membrane. Uh, they're getting your entire body's blood supply stimulated about five times in 20 minutes. So 
to the degree that you're stimulating all of your blood, and it is in fact getting into your brain, I would surmise that there will be benefit at that level. Uh, in terms of directly influencing, say, you know, peak alpha amplitude or coherence or anything like that, I don't think you're going to get much of a bang out of just the intranasal. Um, I certainly think that the neuro, especially the new Neuro 2, which mm -hmm. just came out a couple of weeks ago, and it's 100 milliwatts per channel, and the intranasal is 75 milliwatts. So it's significantly more powerful than the original one, um, but we've gotten great results with the original one, so if people don't want to spend another $250 for the, for the Neuro 2, I can understand that. However, they came out with another device that uses the data from the Peak Hour Institute about 40 hertz and beta amyloid reduction. So they have a neuro now that is not pulsing at 10, but pulsing at 40 hertz. And so they're expecting that they're going to be able to get both a reduction in beta amyloid as well as an increase in ATP and overall, you know, <coughs> Um, neuromodulatory improvement. Anyway, I, I, I can't really give you a definitive answer and because here I'm using the large UK helmet and I'm using the tra and I'm using the neuro. I'm using both. And I certainly would encourage people doing any number of channel training to pre, you know, to warm people up and prime the CNS mm -hmm. to, to do, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a great primer, and it's also, you know, a direct biomedical intervention for improving overall cell respiration and ATP and perfusion and oxygenation and all of the above. I, uh, I have to say to Robert, Robert, you know, we also do Richard's protocols, and mm -hmm. especially where you have an alpha asymmetry at like F3 and F4 and you're doing that protocol, you know, a lot of times using Richard's protocols, you don't get to see the coherence. And all of a sudden you put the V light on, that coherence gets broken up and that frontal alpha just diminishes like magic. And, and ah. you can actually just see that in the amplitude. Well, you oh, saw that change. Yeah, you saw that. It, it, the ISNR video clearly showed the global influence of the stem, in terms, certainly in terms of alpha, and and I would and I would submit, in, in also in terms of coherence. All right, well, so this I'll, is uh, from the. Uh, hang I on one second. Hang on one second. One second. Martin, uh, Marvin, I'm going to email you about a case. It's a it's a relative who's had four TBIs, and that's oh. since being mapped, and she's got some dementia. I want to. I'll talk to you okay. later about the project. For sure. Okay. For sure. Whoever's going to talk, please go ahead. Thanks. Yes, this is Funda, and I really love the presentation. Thank you. I have very quick uh, three questions. Mm -hmm. um, so first of all, uh, you said the research is still ongoing about the lo best locations and uh, wavelengths yes. and that. Yes. But so far, what's your opinion about the locations that work? For example, I'm curious if you stimulate the body, does that impact the brain tissue? Absolutely, absolutely. If if I had if I had one hundred and twenty thousand dollars, I would buy something called the Novathor, uh, which is a full body infrared uh, tanning bed that's not a tanning bed. And I would combine that with the helmet that we're with the technology we're using. That's something we're going to end up doing uh, within the next year: is to have a full body uh, treatment mo model. I see. Thank you. You're welcome. This is this is Meg. I just have a quick question about. Um any okay. negative effects? Like, do you have to worry with a certain population that you might have uh, adverse effects? Um, not so far. The only people I've, the only complaints that people have had with the larger helmet is this thing is too heavy and it looks terrible. Um, the um, the one 
there was one person who had an increase in um, vertigo uh, shortly after they, they came in with pretty severe vertigo from a TBI and they had an exacerbation that lasted for a while and then diminished and it tended to recur over a couple of sessions as, as they got used to what, what we were doing and that's when I really started to see that it really does benefit to do the do Loretta training or do the neurofeedback training as as soon after doing the infrared as possible. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure we're ready for doing the concurrent uh, treatment with any kind of re you know reliability. I mean, Jeff, um, you know your experience is, is encouraging, and we need to do a hell of a lot of work to figure out the timing of all this to make it optimal. Um, okay. All right. We got two minutes. Well, oh. Any more quick last questions, folks? Is there Marvin, any do you, hi. Oh, Victor McGregor. Marvin, do you have any, any studies mm -hmm. where you are using medications in combination in addition to the helmet and all that? Uh, the people in the people in Texas are being required to maintain whatever their medication level is during the course of the trial. Okay, thank you. Somebody else can go now. One last question. One more. <laughs> this is Meg again. I was just curious about age. Is there any age range that it's more appropriate for? I know you're speaking about dementia, but it might help. Oh, uh, no. I, I think that we can. I think we can see that these kind of interventions, you know, can be modified. For, for any age group, certainly if there's trauma or if there's an infectious or inflammatory process, uh, I think you can use these kind of techniques. I think you have to be careful and mindful, but I don't I don't see any reason why we couldn't. Um, I really would like people to spread the word about the clinical trials, and please feel free to be in touch with me, um, and I'll send the slide deck um, to anybody who's interested. And I, I I really appreciate you guys giving me a chance to go on about what I'm doing. Well, Marvin, thank you so much yeah, for your time Thank you very today. much, Marvin. Great, great presentation. Great. All right, um, I will, I'll email you. If you want to email me your PowerPoint and some initial uh, papers, then I can distribute those to our entire listserv and save oh, you a lot of time. Thank you so very you much. Send those to me and I'll, I'll post it for everybody that's here today. They'll see it come out in the listserv and then Good. Uh, and Others can write you ind independently if, if you uh, put okay. your contact. Information. And invite invite me back for part two, um, maybe in November. It'll be done deal. Okay. All right. Take it easy, guys. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thanks, Marvin. Thank you, everybody. Bye. We'll see you all. Uh, see you Friday. Bye, bye. 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 bye.